years that they have that mainly focus on using waves and mobile technology. We're hoping that we can encourage people to come in as well. But whilst we do that, we think it's very important for us to understand the ecosystem that we actually live in, the real world that we actually live in. What are customers' needs? What who are the clients out there? What are the solutions that people are trying to interrogate? And to just get a good grasp on the real world and, and what's happening. So one thing we also like to think of ourselves as we like to think of ourselves as creatives. And in that realm, we posted a couple of talks, and today we decided, or for this month we decided, why don't we look at the creative part of advertising, communication, and say, you know, creativity. So we thought, why not get people who actually run the agencies or who are involved in the agencies to come and speak to us about what is it doing. So we are honored today to have Peter Armstrong, who comes from I said the oldest area, which is wrong, and frankly, actually the most experienced advertising agency in Zambia. And it's uh, an honor for us to have him and to hear his take on advertising as it has grown within the country. And then we also have Maria from BDB. And we're waiting for brands from the from uh, Black Box uh, to arrive. So, I hope that the radius hasn't stopped everybody else from arriving or the traffic hasn't come back a lot of people. But we'll get started for now and I'd like to invite Peter Armstrong. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, and nice to be amongst some of the people that are at the edge of what's happening around the world. So it makes, us, makes me feel good to be here. And uh, certainly I hope that we interact and share a lot today. I don't want to spend my time talking and talking and talking. I think it would be good if we can um, interact and the questions that you have, I think that would be very, very helpful. I think just to, by way of introduction, rather than me uh, going on about Young and Rubicam and who we are, um, you correctly said that the company is called Fulcrum. Yes, it is called Fulcrum because we represent a few brands. The main, one of the main brands that we represent is a company called Young and Rubicam, and another one is called Ogilvy. These are both part of a group called WPP. So I'm coming with my blue hat on today, which is the Young and Rubicam hat, and we're going to talk about um, uh, what I've been asked to talk about is the role of an advertising agency. And I think uh, you're going to be talking about the creative process and working with clients, which I think will also has its challenges as well. Um, so I, I think just by way of introduction, if I could ask you just to play a very short little clip, just a very short something the guys put together, uh, just a very short summary of who we are and some of the clients that we work for in Zambia. all be going to bed tonight going <laughs> so um, yeah so that's that's a little bit of background about who we are I was asked to speak about the role of an advertising agency and 
You know, in this day and age of Google, nothing remains unanswered because we can all be sitting around a dinner table or having a few drinks in the pub and somebody will say, no, I know who scored that goal last year. And then you just have to go and Google it straight and the answer is there. So I know anybody who wants to find out the role of an advertising agency just has to go on Google and says, role of an advertising agency. And there will be 20 different versions of what an advertising agency is supposed to do. And then you could studiously sit here and tick off whether I've left any out. So um, you'd be able to see quite easily whether I'm talking sense or whether um, I'm stretching the truth a little bit. So what I thought I would do is, is speak from my experience of working in Zambia and South Africa for, for a while and, and the exposure that I've had through the Young and Rubicam group and with, with clients, talk about my experience of what I think we should offer as an advertising agency. I was just reading in, uh, on the internet about, because nobody reads a magazine anymore, they just get it all on the internet, and nobody reads more than a full page. It's just a little clip of a news, of a news article from somewhere. So anyway, it's a little clip that came from Forbes magazine. And it says, what is it that clients want these days? And this is obviously in America. The clients want these days from their advertising agency. What is it that they want? And the, the, the article was saying, basically, what the clients are looking for is an integrated solution, a fully integrated solution. So they're not looking for a TV ad or a radio ad or a print ad. Uh, they're looking for the full package. They want uh, big ideas that move through many channels. Okay, uh, and obviously, uh, as as Bongo Hive, here you know all about channels. Okay, um, new channels are coming up every day. One day it's. Um, one day it's this, the next day it's the other one, and they come and they, they go very, very fast. So what, what the clients are looking for is an integrated solution. Uh, and I know you'll find in Zambia, it's been done. Uh, too much to my horror and shock is that you go to a client and they say, uh, well, we've got this big idea for you. We think that it's going to work. It's going to grow your business. It'll build your brand equity. And uh, this is how we think it would work on TV. And they say, oh, no, no, no. We've already got an agency doing our TV ads. Okay, you guys, we want you to focus on radio. And of course, you know, the client is coming from a terrible place and they're heading nowhere. So what, what a, a, a client with a good vision wants is, 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 is uh, an agency with, to be able to offer that full solution. At Young and Rubicam, uh, we developed that concept back in 1976. It was called the whole egg. And it was way before, ahead of its time and people laughed at it. Now it is, it's what we do. The guy, in fact, who, who introduced it, a chap called Ed Ney, who was the chairman of YNR back then, recently passed away. He, be, he was one of the original madmen. And um, he, he introduced that fully integrated solution. So f at the time, what, it, what an integrated solution for Young and Rubicam meant was there would be an advertising agency, there would be a public relations agency, there would be um, a medical marketing agency, they would even have ethnic marketing agency, they would have a healthcare marketing agency, they would have a, um, a, a, an agricultural marketing agency, they would have a research agency, um, you name it, whatever the touch points were, it was covered. And the idea is to integrate a single big idea through all of the channels. Of course, now, as we know, at the point I was making earlier with, with the digital revolution, that has exploded. So people don't know whether it's, um, people don't know whether it's uh, uh, this or that or the other today, but we've seen some big, um, at least some centers of gravity appearing with, with Twitter and Facebook and, uh, and, and YouTube who become, or the, who the big hits, okay? But I think in the States, and in, very, in developed markets, it's become so confusing for people because you've got so many new things coming up every day that people don't know which one to use. In fact, our CEO has got an expression called a gamot. So when something is used by a few people, it's called a gamot, which is an acronym for give me one of those, okay? So it becomes, ve it becomes very uh, um, uh, uh, channel driven and then it loses loses the, the big idea. So we're caught in a place where we've got to try and make a balance between um, the idea and, and, and using the channels properly and not using the channels just for the sake of using them because, because they're new. I think um, 
as an agency, we really have to understand our client's business. We have to take the time to get to understand what are the issues, what drives them, what is the competition doing, what are the trends in the marketplace. We need to be able to do that. Otherwise, we're not going to bring meaningful solutions and meaningful strategy to the client's table. We're not going to make a difference to their business. Um, and we also, we also have to understand what their problems are. I mean, some, I know a good new tool that a lot of people have is they will, a business tool people have in advertising is they will go to a client or a potential client and they will say, what is your biggest problem? What is the one thing that's going to transform your business? And they'll say, oh, well, it's this or it's, I need to reach more people on the copper belt. And they will say, they will take that as an opportunity to, to, uh, to help grow the client's business. So that's what we need to do as an advertising agency. The other point I've got down here is, um, we really need to understand the customer's clients, okay? Now, uh, we've seen this whole thing of audience segmentation has gone 360. In fact, it's gone 360 about 10 times. I don't know how many that is, it's 3,600. But um, it started with the traditional demographics and psychographics and yes, some people was an A1 or a B1 living in an urban or rural area, peri-urban area. Uh, and now, um, and then we got into, into customer segmentation where if you work with any of the mobile guys, you'll know that they have succeeded and they have explorers and they have um, even some companies give them local names like I know I've worked with MTN they will, they will call these Tamangas and they will call this other segment some of us and the other ones you know so and, and things like that so um, you really, really have to understand the, 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 the client's customers. Uh, and one of the best ways of doing that as an agency is to do one-on-one um, -on -one interviews. You, you know, we can do focus groups. Focus groups are fine. Uh, and you will be able to write a report and it'll say that these people do this and these people, do, and you'll get your, your, uh, your general uh, feedback in terms of consumer behavior. But to understand what the, we really need to, to make a difference, we need to make sure that the brand may Makes an emotional connection with the consumer. So when we do, when we are, when we say understand the clients, customers, we need to spend time with them, sit with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Why do you use this tea in the morning? Why do you go? Why will you drive uh, when you're going past the supermarket and you can get bread here? Why will you go out of your way to go and get bread at the other place? Is it the product? Is it the brand? What is it? Understand those dynamics. So we really, really have to um, have to look at that. Um, you can tell when people, somebody's getting old because the piece of paper always gets a bit further and further away. Um, understand. And also, as the role in an agency, it's not really a role you'd find in a normal definition, but something that's very good is to, uh, it's one of the oldest uh, uh, things, that love thy neighbor. You, you can love your clients as well. Okay, even those with uh, ringing phones and people come with ringing phones to, to presentations, we should love them too. So uh, love, love, your, um, love your clients, get to know your clients, treat them as friends. Okay? If the client is going to go through a divorce if the, or if the client has got a baby on the way, you as an agency should be the first person to know because you're the most trusted friend. Okay? I was flabbergasted when I first went to New York in 1980-something for training with Youth y and uh, this guy called Roby Harrington who was in charge of the Ford account globally. And he sat down and he chatted with us and he said, treat your clients as friends. I was saying, what? You want me to treat that lot as friends? But um, because they're all shouting at you. And in our, in our business, one thing's for sure you, is pressure deadlines. Okay? And um, there's only one lot of per people that we feel more, self, more sorry for than, than we in advertising, and that's the people in printing. Because if we have one day, they've only got half a day to do it. Okay? And, or the people in TV production. Um, so, 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 so the point is that that, um, uh, what was, I was on, um, yeah, so get to know your clients, uh, get to know them well, uh, because we're under pressure, we really, really have to deliver on, on time. And, and get to know the people, get to know the client well. So, 
And sometimes it is difficult when, when somebody slams the phone down on you because their boss is on, on whatever. But uh, as, as, as an agency, once we get to know the person and you explain the situation to them, and, you, and uh, the, which is my next point, is to be honest and transparent um, with your clients, th then, then, you, then you have mutual trust. A lot of people think that we, we people in advertising like to just pull wool over people's eyes because they think that we do like mass his, no, hypnosis or something through TV. TV and, and therefore that our business uh, lacks integrity and we're just trying to make a quick buck. It's not like that at all. One of the most important things, we try to be as transparent and as honest as we can. And as a role as an agency for clients, very often they have got all of their missions and values and we have to make sure that we uphold those missions and values that the, that the clients have. Um, and the other thing as, as an agency that we, we, we should do as the role of an agency is to remember that although the clients will give you a schedule of outputs, I want a 30 second ad, I want a 20 by 5, I want a 15 second radio stings, I need some bumpers for the internet, I need a Facebook, I need a this, they'll give you a shopping list from like here to there. Okay, so in the end you think that you're in the production business, you're in the business of making ads and it's fine, we have to do all of those deliverables. But one thing we must remember as an agency, we're not in the business of making ads, we are in the business of communicating with people and entertaining them. When somebody goes at home to switch on the television, they don't go home to be sold. They're not going home to look at ads so that they can say, oh, what's the next phone I can buy? No, because they want to watch television, they want to be entertained. And therefore our advertising has to move from, uh, from what we call interruption, it's not interrupting the consumer to engaging, to engaging with the consumer. And no more a time is better than this right now with the explosion that we have with the digital content. Now consumers, we, uh, people are doing crowdsourcing, uh, consumers are doing creative themselves. Uh, We've seen hundreds and hundreds of examples of campaigns around the world where they reach out to consumers through social media and the consumers come up with the idea. I saw, I saw one uh, case study where in Spain for, for Unilever they created a whole soap opera where the audience from, from social media was writing this soap opera and even doing the casting. So everything is extremely, extremely collaborative these days. So we must remember that we've got a big opportunity to engage with customers and be meaningful in their lives and to really um, uh, and to really help to tell the story of tell the story of the brand um, that's what people listen to okay um, and then finally for us uh, our guy Raymond Rubicam who started the agency back in 1923 in Philadelphia. Uh, he sat down on a park bench with a guy called Ian Or Young and they started, they started the agency with, uh, interestingly enough, they'd left an agency called Armstrong Advertising. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what went wrong there. But anyway, they, they started it and um, they got their first, they started in Philadelphia. Their first client was Kraft and they grew to be a global agency. But they had had one benchmark, one slogan that we've used through all of our all of our time, which is resist the usual. And we try to resist the usual in everything we do internally. And it's not easy. It is the most difficult thing to do is to resist the usual. You know, you'll go with an, a nice big idea in your pocket, and you won't have the guts to stand up to the client and say, "This is the big idea that you've come up with." You'll always go with that, and then you have a backup one in the bag. And in case you don't like, then there's this one also. So um, you see, you're laughing. So. Uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's one of the most difficult things to do, is to resist the usual. Try to, try to do what, not to do what everybody's doing, because that really is what gives the brand the cut through. And, and also, therefore, one of our role, one of the roles that we have as advertising agents to our clients is to be able to argue with them and to say no, and to disagree with them. Because otherwise, what's the point of them hiring us to do the creative? Because they can just get somebody internally to, to say yes or make the headline bigger. Well, would you like it bigger? The or first thing, of course, has to be bigger. The logo has to be bigger and has to be at the top and, and those sort of things. So, um, yeah, we have to resist the usual and we have to, we have to be firm and we have to believe in our ideas. Uh, but we have to also be fully accountable to make sure that those ideas are ideas that really are going to make a difference to the client's business. Very often we end up making advertising for ourselves. 
or we end up making the making advertising that we know that the, the marketing director or the marketing director makes advertising that he knows the MD is going to like. Okay, um, and we should be making we should be making more communication that the consumer likes. So. That's the thing is, the same guy who told me you can be friends with your clients also said great clients are not born, they are made, <laughs> okay, they're made. So we have to work with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Look, here's a case study to show that this crazy advert increased sales by whatever amount or, you know. So it's also up to us to, to, to work and, and educate our clients like that so that we become partners and not just suppliers. And we find that it's becoming more and more led and driven to social media. If you look at the work that we're doing for the Zambia Music Awards at the moment for Mossi Laka, last year we had, you could vote uh, on SMS and you could vote online. This year we, we moved, the, we put an app in where you can vote on Facebook as well. So the number of responses is like going, I think within the first week we had, uh, we had 10 times the amount of votes for the first week than we did have for the whole of the last season, for the nominations rather, the voting has just started. So that's a, that's a huge thing. Uh, and uh, now, for example, we're doing a program on the same music awards that's going on, uh, on air tomorrow night. It's also going to be released on YouTube at exactly the same time. Um, uh, and we'll be making comments as well. Because you can't, you can't avoid uh, what they call second screen. So when people are watching TV, they're engaging on the second screen. Some have even got third screens, okay? And now there's all kinds of new terms because when you are watching something on one screen and it's about the Zambia Music Awards and that program is called it's called meshing. Okay? So if you're on Facebook and you and you're watching the football, that's called stacking because you're doing two different things. And then the other one which I can't remember is is uh, um, is when you, you start one transaction or start on one device and then finish off on another device. So the whole language is changing and all of these bad words are going to come up. But yes, social media, it's big. Uh, Zambia, I think, uh, you guys know the statistics. Our digital guy came up with a figure. It's always getting up to 750,000. There was one posting uh, the other day we did for, for Music Awards. We've got a thousand comments. And that's a lot. Um, and, and I think when you start multiplying the number of people that are reading and, and reading articles on Facebook and the referred stories and the sponsored links, sometimes uh, I think postings even get higher readership than the Post newspaper. So it's become one of the most important media. And in advertising, just to add on that, um, people like Google, uh, our chief executive Martin Sorrell from WPP calls them frenemies <laughs> because they've got all the data. Yes. So we've got huge amounts of training resources available in South Africa. But in fact, what we do maybe is something we can discuss within YNL. We've got they've got a, a thing called Spark Plug, okay, where they offer young techie people that are at the cutting edge. They offer you them office space to come and work and to work on client solutions. So that there there are those opportunities, and it's all about. It's not, uh, these days it's not about owning something, it's about sharing. Okay, once you get that center of gravity because people are sharing, that's when the value starts kicking in. Uh, Lee Iacocca, the chairman of Chrysler, I think it was, or whatever, whichever company it was, he said, I know that half of my advertising works, but I don't know which half. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, but of course now with data, it's all becoming a different thing because everything is measurable. There's no such thing as saying to the client, oh, it's a great ad, it's a great ad. My wife really liked it, so it must be a good ad. But you put an ad on YouTube and you'll get the feedback straight away. My history is not as long as Peter's, uh, but it's somewhere around there. Um, DDB has been in existence for a very long time, uh, founded by three guys, Doyle, Dane, Bedback. Um, DDB in Zambia has been operational for about seven years now. I came to DDB three years ago. But my experience has been in fast-moving consumer goods. I came from a background of spa and stuff like that. So advertising is all new to me. But um, it's exciting. I, I think I'll answer a lot of your questions in terms of how clients behave. One of the things that I found very interesting working in the advertising industry is that clients are two things. Either treacherous or tremendous, two things. So you'll probably get those nasty clients that, um, and when I get into my, my talk today, you'll get to see how that happens with most clients. Um, you'll get two types of clients. Some that actually know what they want, 
out of an advertising campaign or on a project, they actually know exactly to the T what they want to deliver. Some have no clue. So it is the job of an advertising agency to actually structure that and this is what I'm going to talk to you about. Working with a client on a project, on a project. So is one thing and it's called the brief. That's what will make it or break it. Um, they will throw, like like Peter said, they will, they, will, they will come with a shopping list, as in from anything that you can think of. Can I do this? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I would like to do this. So it's, it's, but you have to structure it, and you can structure it in a, in a brief. And how you structure it is, 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 I think, on three platforms. One is, is to actually understand the strategic direction of where you want to go. And then you get into defining the message. What is it that we want to talk about? Where, who, why, and that. And then the last thing would obviously be the result. What do we want to get out of it? So that's just how you work with clients on projects. And they will digress. They will, they will give you all this, oh, what about this? You need to bring them back to the brief. This is what we agreed. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing that we'd like to do when we, we talk to a client, when we engage with a client on a, on a project. So we'll talk about the brief. The brief, it, it goes in two ways. The client is supposed to give you a brief, and the agency is also supposed to actually understand what the brief is. We understand what it is, we go back to the client, have a face-to-face -face meeting and agree on what that brief is. In that brief, we structure the outcomes, the deliverables, the timelines, the budgets, and that's how we can actually then get an understanding of what the client is. Without that, it's, 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 I can bring up a, a tremendous idea, but then go back to the client and the client will tell me, actually I don't have money for a TVC, actually I don't have money for a radio ad, let's just go below the line. And yet I've spent a whole two, three days bringing up brilliant ideas and co -op. So I think we, we need to get to that basic and that's the gist of any brief. Um, I think that's that's how you work with clients on a project. But um, I think I have Rufus here. He's one of my clients. You you then have a lot of Richard Russell. Yeah. <laughs> you have you have things that then throw spanners into a, a, a good strategy. One of the the one thing that we did recently was decided to go to a committee with a decision. And this is this is what we come up with different sectors, different people, different inputs. I think this would be great. But decisions by committee don't work. When you're working with a project, you want the decision makers, the ones that will actually say, you know what, this is the decision, this is how we're gonna go, and this is how we gonna we're gonna go to market. And I think one of the last the, my last point, I told you mine is gonna be five minutes. <laughs> Literally five minutes. Um, my last point is the result. Like Peter said, you want to measure what it is that you have done. Has my campaign reached the intended audience, the intended numbers, brought in the sales if it was, if it was the objective? Has, has it made any impact on, on the people that we're trying to talk to? And I think uh, we need to get more into having clients themselves getting to measuring what they've done. I, I think most marketing managers now want to get a great campaign out there and they've done their work. As in who it has reached and the numbers, it really doesn't matter for them. They are on to the next campaign. Then at the end of the day, what are we really doing? I think we, we need to get to a point where we force our clients to measure what it is that they're doing. And I think we'll be able to structure things better. We have a set, a, a set of questions that when we go and have a discussion with the client, we'll ask and we do the brief ourselves and ask them to sign it up. Um, this is what we have agreed and, and then we'll start working from there. I think three quarters of the clients don't have the, the discipline to give us a proper brief. That they, they're, they're trying to, to, to get to. So if, if they don't give you concrete, it's, it's very difficult to work with that. But then we, we kind of try and execute, which is one of the things that I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. in terms of execution. I think uh, a week ago I went to a pitch and um, we did a great creative concept and everything. The question was, how are you going to execute? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's important for us to know to the T, and this is where the brief comes in as well. When you research well enough in terms of what are the pitfalls, what are going to 
going to be the setbacks, well, how am I actually going to do a demonstration in Kalingalinga where there's going to be mobs of people, would I actually be able to do this? It's all well and good to put it on paper that I can do this, but we have to actually think of the execution to the team. I think a lot of clients have seen this fail at the execution level. The idea would have been great, but at the execution level it fails and it looks like the whole thing has failed. But I think so if you have seen a standard ad, you've seen DDB. If you have seen a, a UNICEF project being rolled out, you have seen DDB. And I think that's where I would like to keep it at. Yes, we'll keep top of mind awareness of who we are, but we would like to advertise to our clients mostly than to the general public. I, I don't think that's, that's our target audience at all. It's the clients that we need. And there's ways of getting to our clients other than putting a radio ad on radio. I mean, Zambia in general's uh, advertising rates are a bit higher than everywhere else in the world. But I don't think that's the reason why somebody would put a one minute ad instead of a 15 second ad. I think it's been, it boils down to the brief, it boils down to their objectives and if they got them right. I think that's what it boils down to. I don't think it's the cost of advertising in, in Zambia. It's, it's about what they've been advised or what they think will, will reap what they're trying to do, their objectives. Uh, it's always um, put you uh, in an awkward position if great minds speak ahead of you, <laughs> like Maria here and uh, the champion Peter. Where is he? Okay, um, so I'll briefly talk about uh, maybe uh, uh, Black Dot. Uh, Black Dot started in um, uh, 1991. I've been around for quite a bit. And uh, when we started, we just started, we started as DNC advertising. And then in 1997, we uh, got the Sachi and Sachi affiliation and we became DNC Sachi and Sachi. Then until recently, last year in March, um, the 1st of March, we rebranded to Black Dot. The reason why that happened was because Publicis, which has always been the holding company of Sachi, and Sachi worldwide, I uh, bought off South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, Sachi and Sachi, and uh, that meant us uh, uh, rebranding and changing because uh, it meant that now all the three uh, major brands were under us here in Zambia, which was Sachi and Sachi, Publicis and Leo Bennett, so we couldn't be called under one of them. We had to come up with a neutral name, and uh, we found it fit to call ourselves Black Dot. Black Dot was just a name from the sky. <laughs> Uh, basically what we thought about uh, that name, what's behind that name is that whatever you write starts with a dot and whatever you create starts with a dot. So that's where the name came from. That's the little explanation I can, I can do about that. Okay, that's about uh, Sachi and Sachi Black Dot now. Okay, so I have a privilege to talk about how agencies create and execute ideas. I think that my introduction has been covered by Maria, I told you, bright, great minds ahead of me. She's already spoken about this, so I'm gonna uh, skip through it. <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll skip through that and uh, I'll, I'll go straight to um, Path to Love. Um, now, you'll be wondering why we may, I'm using such words, uh, path to love. Basically, if you talk of ideas, it's something that you really need to um, uh, connect and relate with people. And if it's something that has to relate and connect with people, uh, it has to interest them and attract them some, some, somehow. Okay? Um, this, this diagram here is showing you a few, a few words. When you want to do anything or create anything that you want to in, encourage or entice the public, first of all, even us in our relationships, I mean, those of you who are married and those of you who've got fiancés and girlfriends, the first thing you do is you discover. Now, when you discover, you first of all have to do a bit of exploring just to get more insight and other ideas up to about what is what is happening. So during exploration, that's the time you get pe to meet people, you create, make dates and all that, let's go out for lunch and things like that. And then of course, when you do that, you're going to get inspired. When you get that inspiration, you begin to get attracted to certain things. And that attraction will now bring you to a point where you need to evaluate and see this thing that I've known, this thing that I've discovered and I'm attracted to it, what is it about this, this thing? And then you evaluate and do that. And then you will now see these pictures that I've put here. Of course, when you are talking of a brand, it, a brand is not just birthed from nowhere. It's something that has to be developed and pushed until somebody gets to know about it and they fall in love with it. 
maybe I would ask a question. I think Maria would be the best person to answer this one. Uh, or anybody in the, in the audience. If Jaribu, we all know Jaribu, eh? I'm not talking about the Now there's so many brands and all that, but the original Jaribu that we know, 50 years ago and 45 years ago, 30 years ago, the Jaribu we know, and we are seeing the results now in most, uh, <laughs> most lives. It, what does it do to the skin? You know, China. Okay, so now, if Jaribu were a man, who would he be? You've got Will Smith, James Bond, Denzel Washington, and Wesley Snipes. Who would it be? Who would it be? James Bond. Why James Bond? Huh? What? Because he's light skinned. Ah, okay. Ah, I see. Anybody else with a different opinion? <laughs> you want? <laughs> okay. All right. So we're getting all these answers and all that. So the point is that for a brand to be created and loved, there's, there's a history behind it. You work towards it. You work at it. You receive a brief. She talked about a brief. When a client sends you a brief, of course, they've got objectives. They've got something that they want to achieve. So all that is a journey for you to arrive at a brand that you yourself, even before you give it to another person, you have to love it. You have to feel it, you have to experience it and like it before you give it to another person. And when you give it to another person, they'll obviously fall in love with it. And when they fall in love with it, they become loyal to, to it, to that brand. Uh, they, I just want to quickly run through the strategic approach for you to arrive at a brand or a product or anything that you need to fall, what you want to fall in love with, you have to have a strategic approach to, to, to it. So the question was, how do agencies uh, create and execute ideas? This is where it begins from. When you receive a, a brief from the client, uh, of course it comes to the agency. Now, of, obviously the, the, the account managers or uh, account executives or whatever you may, you may call it in your agency, but you, re, account managers will receive the brief. And when they do receive the brief, they will have to uh, interpret that brief and create another brief for the, create, uh, for the creatives, for them to understand exactly what the client requires uh, of you. But you have to create, um, the, make the objective depending on their main marketing objective. And then obviously, when you do your exploration like I talked about, you'll find that there are a number of issues that you have to deal with. Or always a brand or a product has got issues. And you need to find out what are those issues. When you do exploration, you go out there in the market to find out what people are talking about the, uh, the product. They will bring out certain things. And when you come back to the station, you have to now find a way of how to work around those issues to give your client a good you know, product or say the better words for the people to love their product. And then after that, you get to have an insight. And insight are basically the truths about what people know or what people want uh, to have or to know. And then after that, you need to come up with your challenge now, your communication challenge. What are the words that you need to use for the customer or for the people out there to be able to understand or know for them to fall in love with that, that brand or product? Everything has changed in the world. The landmark has changed. So it's not about imposing anything on anybody and they take it. Today we change the shamuli bakaunda what they used to do. They would just impose things on you and all that. But now it's no longer like that. You have to engage with the audience. You have to engage with the market. You know, uh, talk to them uh, at that level. Entice them, uh, you know, on a one-on-one. -on -one. I can run through that. Uh, we don't have much time. I'll just cruise through. So we believe that success in the new attraction economy belongs to those who can make deep emotional connections in the market. Trust, respect, and admiration are no longer enough these days. You, you can't just say, no, I respect them, I trust them, and I admire them. It, it doesn't end there. You have to go a step, a step further. The only currency of any sustainable value in the attraction economy is ideas that attract customers. Okay, you can't just uh, talk about ideas. There was a question there, but there's some work adverts, fake adverts, adverts that don't make sense. When you produce an advert and you air it or you, you publish it, people are even questioning. They are talking in, in the streets, in the corridors, how terrible the advert, you know, uh, uh, is. So like that, it doesn't attract them. 
So you need to have uh, ideas that will attract the customers. And this is for the benefit of our clients. The client will be happy if their product you know, attracts the, their customers. And who does that? The agency you know, comes in between there. The number one job for us uh, in this emerging attention economy, attraction economy, is to generate insights and to draw consumers uh, uh, in. Love marks form a key pillar in what we believe in. It's talking about love in the air and all these things. And what is this animal, love marks? Um, is it a love? a love mark is a product, service, or entity that inspires action and loyalty beyond reason. If you fall in love with something, you won't question it. You won't ask. You won't do anything. You just become loyal to it because you have fallen in love with it. And who does that? It's the ideas, the great ideas, the beautiful ideas that that do that for them to be able to create um, that kind of thing that we're talking about. Love marks are instantly recognizable. When you are in love with something, it can just be a flash. You haven't even seen it for two, three, four, five minutes. But as long as it passes there and you recognize it, you'll be able to name it. Because why? Somebody did the background work. Somebody did a good job to sell that product or to make that product visible and a household name. So whatever you want to, 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 to connect with, um, uh, I mean, when we come up with ideas, the ideas have to be those that will be able to connect with people, OK? You don't just bring up something at the end of the day, but you must ask yourself, is it going to connect with this person? Is it going, going, going to connect with the market? Okay? And after that, that is where they're going to draw uh, their, their own, make their own decisions uh, from there. So to build a love mark, be prepared. Mystery, senses, and intimacy. Okay? Okay. And this is what happens. Just leave some mystery around that and then play people's senses. Help them feel something about your brand. Just help them feel something about, about your brand. You're dealing with uh, 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 owners of brands here, companies. Um, Mwewa well, is here uh, from Barclays. I'm sure if I do injustice to his brand, he will hate me for the rest of, of his life for as long as he's, he's a custodian of that brand. But if I do something to his brand that makes people look forward to it and want to fall in love with it, he will love me and he would want me to do more. Okay? So be intimate. Take the time to understand what matters to them and then reveal what matters to you. That's very important for you to be able to create uh, great ideas. This woman here, Maya Angelou, uh, sh she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Is that true? Yes. They will never forget how you make them feel. So we need to make sure that whatever we do, whatever we create, whatever ideas we come up with, let it make uh, 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 the people, your customer, your target market, remember uh, those things. They should not, they should never forget ideas and how to get there. I just cruise through this. An organizing idea, I talked briefly about the objective, the issue, the insight, and the communication challenge. At the end of the day, all those things that I talked about, you need to summarize them in one thing, which we call the organizing idea. Now, the organizing idea will be the one thing that is going to drive your creative strategy. It's going to be a heads up, a kickstart to your creative guys to be able to know how to think. Okay, because you have a strategy, you've created a, a framework, a strategy that the creative will have to work with, which is the big idea. So one, uh, the, big, the organizing idea should be one that is emotionally engaging, like I mentioned earlier, and one that connects heart to head and head, that can inspire love and respect, capable of in engendering deep attraction, one that springs form and is at the heart of the brand, authentic and inspiring.